Hey, good morning. This budget hearing conducted by the Committee on Appropriations and Adjudication now reconvenes with discussions for the fiscal year 2017 budget proposal from the University of Guam. I want to preface this budget hearing and future hearings with the fact that the government of Guam has a FY 2015 cumulative general fund deficit of about 120 million. More now than ever, we all have to understand that increasing expenditures against potential decline or flat revenue levels may not be realistic. We may all have to come to that realization either now or sometime in the future. Before I ask the president to speak, I, I want to thank and commend the university. Um, not sure if you have a hearing class up there or a critical thinking class, but I want to thank you for actually hearing what the, I have been saying for the last <laughs> month and submitting a budget that actually is less than last year's. That's right. And um, I wish other departments would come in with a similar budget request. I, I'll, I'll allow you to, to speak, but I just wanted to say that on behalf of the Committee on Appropriations, I just want to acknowledge that fact, and I want to thank the university and the regents for, for recognizing the dire fiscal condition of the government and being responsible and realistic about our condition and coming forward with a, um, with a budget that is even lower than status quo. Um, and so um, with that... Um, All right. Okay. With that, um, we can we can proceed. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Cruz, Vice Speaker Cruz, and the other distinguished senators who are with you here this morning. Uh, we have uh, with me uh, to help with the presentation uh, the Senior Vice President, Dr. Anita uh, Enriquez, and uh, the Vice President of Admin and Finance, uh, Mr. Randy Wiegan and Rachel Kabukab has prepared the slides and we're hastily trying to figure out what happened uh, with our uh, slide projector. <laughs> but fortunately, you have the slides in front of you. And I also want to uh, thank uh, Regents uh, uh, Herrero and uh, Santos for showing up this morning. Um, and Gail. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. And Regent Gail, thank you for reminding me. I have to watch my P's and Q's with them. <laughs> Uh, you know, as, as you have pointed out, uh, we, we, uh, uh, last year we had a uh, budget proposal that was over 31 million and, you know, we, had get, we were uh, kind of committed to get a million dollars that we never actually saw, but, you know, nevertheless, uh, we continued to persevere and we are really uh, happy to present this budget and I just want to uh, point out uh, some of the key drivers of uh, what happens at the University of Guam. Uh, the enrollment uh, com upcoming year will exceed 4,000 students. Uh, this growth is uh, driving UOG expansion its costs. Achieving the great University of Guam continues to be reflected as we reach new levels of excellence in various degree programs, uh, research and services. And uh, the budget, as uh, we have requested, will enable uh, the university to continue to provide uh, accessible education and develop the social and economic capacity in our communities uh, to help create change and growth through uh, research and innovation and, uh, and as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Vice Speaker, uh, high levels of critical thinking. And it will also, uh, this budget will also allow us to an, uh, ensure that anticipated WASC uh, recommended activities uh, are met. I want to point out that the Board of Regents uh, supports the budget uh, presented today. Uh, the Board of Regents are active participants in the planning sessions on strategic initiatives, long-term financial plans, and budget assumptions. The board reviews and oversees all university budgets and are adopted by resolution. Uh, the entire university community gets to see the budget and it goes through our uh, uh, shared governance process. Everybody is allowed to make comments, uh, including students, faculty, and staff members. 
uh, the board reviews financial performance regularly and the board uh, respectfully requests the legislature fully fund uh, the university's appropriation requests. I uh, just want to take time uh, on our third slide to uh, continue the uh, year in review. Uh, this past year, we conferred 571 uh, degrees in academic year 2015 to 2016. Uh, we had a record high en enrollment of 3,991 students, and we expect to exceed 4,000 in the upcoming semester. The successful WASC accreditation review, which we are authorized, although it's not been finalized in form, but the WASC accreditation team has authorized us to tell uh, you and the general public uh, that WASC accreditation review has resulted in an additional eight years of accreditation. Um, I want to point out that what that means and the way that this recommendation will come up is we will not be visited by an accreditor until the year 2024. Uh, this speaks enormous volumes about the quality and the integrity of the university. Uh, you know, unlike many other institutions that are constantly undergoing constant review, uh, prior to 2009, uh, our longest uh, accreditation period was five years. 2009, uh, we got eight years. And then in 2000, this, this year, we're getting an additional eight years. We're back up? All right. Let's get to the, which slide? We're back up. Here we go. All right. We also, the good to great process continues to be um, uh, implemented. Uh, as uh, many of you know, we've advertised this. This is a, a highly integrative process in which we are uh, making decisions about program prioritizations and reaching excellence and, and tightening the mission and the purpose of the university. Uh, in 2015, we obtained low risk oddity uh, status uh, for 2015. Uh, RCUOG first year audit resulted in no material findings, and we want to uh, thank the Guam legislature and the people of Guam for helping us uh, make these accomplishments. WASC accreditation, 16 years of good governance. Now, I, I want to point out that, as I've, uh, as I've indicated, we have the 16 years, but I want to point out that the legislature has been extraordinarily helpful in preparing for the recent WASC visit. Uh, and uh, WASC was exceptionally uh, complementary of the G2G process. They called it innovative. They called it, uh, they, in, in one sense, they said that it created a lot of risk, but it was a very innovative uh, process that uh, very few universities would ever take on. So this, this is very different than a normal process of review where uh, universities normally just respond by going standard by standard by standard. We went that route, but we also pointed out how all of these are wrapped up in our Good to Great initiative. Uh, WASC um, also pointed out, recognizes the extraordinarily uh, effective internal governance processes at the university and the appropriate relationship between the university, the legislature, and the governor. Uh, the, the system of governance in place is that you have uh, institutional autonomy, which is recognized and respected by external authorities, and then you have the internal uh, governance of the university, which is bared, based on shared uh, uh, information transparency. By the time this 16 years is concluded, and, and for those of you with longer memories, you'd have to go back to 1999 and 2000, 2001, 2002. This would have marked 16 years that not one single word about governance has ever been mentioned by the accreditors. This is really an uh, enormous record of achievement. I also want to point out that in their commendations, which is very unusual, they singled out the Board of Regents as being extraordinarily knowledgeable, extraordinarily helpful, and, and, and uh, participatory in the, in, the, uh, in the implementation of broad objectives for the university. And they do all of this for, you know, the princely sum of their board stipend of zero dollars per month. I always tease them about this because, you know, they're one of the, uh, they, they, don't, they don't receive a, a stipend. 
And Waska will recommend, uh, maybe we'll start giving them one, I don't know. <laughs> Recommends activities uh, which will require more investment in some of our initiatives, big data, the collection of big data, how to understand institutional <coughs> trends, connectivity, and programs, especially to increase student graduation rates and campus upgrades. So basically, our budget request, when we came here, uh, uh, last year, uh, we uh, had uh, uh, approved 30.6 million, and then we were supposed to get an additional million, which, as you know, never really happened. Uh, but, you know, we tried. <laughs> and so uh, it always goes to show you that what, maybe not what's passed in the budget law always works out like we had hoped. But nevertheless, uh, so we're coming back this year, and we're asking for 31.02 million, which is less than the approved budget last year. Uh, but a little bit more than what we actually asked for last year, 400,000. We're asking for 3.6 million for the student financial aid program and uh, half a million for the special appropriations for weary and hatchery, which are kind of like uh, uh, normal that has been done for years. Our general operations expenses, uh, our personnel, we anticipate uh, that increase to meet enrollment demand and to meet the G2G positions. Uh, including, uh, you know, uh, an additional position for the anticipated School of Engineering. Uh, contracts remain relatively flat. Supplies, equipment re remain relatively flat. Utilities remains relatively flat, even though we continue to decline in kilowatt hour usage because we're actually using more of our facilities longer uh, around, and we have more facilities. But even given all that, we're still... Uh, uh, within the, the, the margin here of $4 million. Our capital outlay is $0.9 million for preventive and deferred maintenance. Our research capacity, uh, we are giving $370,000 to the RC Research Corporation, University of Guam, but I've proposed uh, a, a reassessment of the indirect cost fee structure inside the university, which the Board of Regents will take up so that by the beginning of the academic year, we'll actually save some 260000 of that. So we want to make sure that RCUOG is on a real pathway uh, to self-sufficiency, which it should be. And uh, so uh, we have additional revenue covered by uh, tuition uh, costs. Our general operations um, uh, appropriation as you can see, has been, you know, relatively around the $31 million uh, mark for uh, uh, many years. I always uh, like to point out that when I was academic vice president uh, for the University of Guam in 1992, we had an appropriation of $35 million from the Guam legislature. And so here we are some uh, 24 years later and we're talking about 31 million, but it hasn't kept the universe. It doesn't mean that the university is crying and screaming and hollering that if we had just gone by the consumer price index, we'd be up to 55 million dollars. But we don't, we don't do that. We try to take steps to be self-sufficient. We do our external grants and contracts. We have money-making ventures, uh, units that try to do as much as we can. And so this is, uh, this is uh, uh, I think, a, a very excellent record of achievement for the university. And I want to show this to you because it, it shows you the dynamics of what has happened at the University of Guam. The year 2000, actually the year 2002, you can see that of the money that the university spends in the year 2000, and the last year was 2002 where this figure was basically around the same, 51% of the money that we spend came from government of Guam appropriation. In the year 2015, 39% of the money that we spend comes from government appropriation. 39%, and we've almost uh, more than doubled are the money that we get from federal grants and contracts. And so we need the capacity to continue that dramatic growth. So, you know, we're almost equal in, in, uh, in uh, amount of money that we're getting from the federal government. And then we have, of course, tuition. And if you, even if you, if you look at tuition, you can see that we were more reliant on tuition in the year 2000, 18 uh, percent, than we are today. So that even the tuition is very affordable, even given the recent increase, and it actually uh, 
uh, you know, uh, points out that there's a um, uh, less reliance on, so when people understand, you know, the net financial picture of the university, you see where tuition plays the role in the life of the university. The good to great framework. Just a, a few words on this. We, we are identifying areas where the University of Guam is good and plan on becoming great through integrating the regional mission with academic programs and support functioning functions. Fo focusing on those areas where only UOG can achieve greatness. This is a very, uh, this is a, a concept that we borrowed uh, from business, from Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. Then he wrote a book called Good to Great in the, private, in the Public Sector. Then we took that and we married it up with program prioritization. And then we tried to figure out what is the hedgehog of the university? What is it the university is passionate about? And what can it be great at that no other university in the world can be great at? And then how does that connect to our finances? And when you have that hedgehog working and people are aware of financing, you know, in a university, typically what happens, or what usually happens, is a professor will say, this is a great idea. This is a good program. I think we ought to pass it. And then they talk to other professors, and then he, they campaign with the other professors, and then they say, oh, this is a great idea. Okay, let's pass it. Let's move it up the chain. And then it gets to my office, and they say, yeah, we love this idea. Well, how are you going to pay for it? Well, I don't know. That's your job. Go ask the legislature for money. Go do this. Go do that. We've changed the trajectory on that thinking. That's the good to great prioritization process. We've made everybody responsible for not just coming up with great ideas, but good ideas on how to fund them and trying to figure out what is the cost of your program. And people never like to answer that question, you know. They never want to answer the question. So, you know, uh, just give an example. I told we had three chemistry professors. So this is what teaching chemistry costs the University of Guam. Your salaries, your, you know, what, what we put in. And this is what you bring in to the University of Guam. So, you know, and some of them say, wow, I didn't know we cost that much. You know, I said, so the argument is not about just the value of chemistry. The argument is what is the value of chemistry given our regional mission and our purpose, and how are we going to finance it? So that's the kind of the hedgehog. So greatness for us consists of le leadership in learning, teaching, discovery, and service that pres preserves the essential strengths of the region's culture and natural resources. So this is a board policy that is reified through Guam public law and the regional purpose. Since the very beginning of the University of Guam, the people of Guam through the Guam legislature and through the government of Guam has given our regional neighbors resident tuition, even though they don't give us any money. And think about the value of that. And that has been ongoing for almost 50 years. And so everybody in this region is entitled to come here as if they were a resident because the people of Guam have made that commitment from its very beginning. It's in our DNA as an institution. And so that, 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 we don't want to move away from that because that's our essential strength. Because when we serve the region that way and then we apply for grants and contracts, we, we serve the region through our grants and contracts. So that becomes part of our hedgehog. We don't separate it, we integrate it. We imagine what we are as a regional institution for research purposes, for degree purposes, for tuition purposes, and we mesh it all and we see if this really makes sense. And it does. And we're making it even make more sense as we go out for more grants and contracts. And so we apply those strengths to new challenges in flexible multiple ways that transform the students of the university, the university's partners, and the university itself. So with that, we'll go to the G2G challenges, and I'll ask uh, the SVP to say a few words. You need to turn your mic on. Yes. Good morning. G2G challenges, uh, these are going to require uh, targeted, meaningful investments of what we call the ecosystem of support that already exists on our campus. Uh, the theme in terms of uh, 
uh, sustainability has always been uh, we need to be resourceful, we need to be creative in light of the fact that funding is flat and in light of the fact that we are on a, an enrollment growth and retention uh, trajectory. So revising and strengthening the student experience is very important. To keep students engaged, we need them to be fully aware of the many different opportunities uh, that exist on campus. Uh, in that regard, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, uh, we do have a, a major initiative that will keep that transparency and that open communication available. Uh, getting, uh, breaking down the silos, having uh, every unit engage as a collective to uh, assure that student success is always at the forefront certainly is something that we started working on. And I'll talk a little bit about the Student Success Innovation Team and its initiatives in which uh, we were praised by our WAS visiting team. Uh, the second challenge in terms of improving human resource management and experiment with new staff and faculty portfolios, recognizing as well that uh, the new, new uh, position lines, the new FTEs, aren't going to fall from the sky and that we can't keep appearing before our funding uh, or our funders to give us these additional positions and so forth. So what the university has engaged innovatively is uh, to re revisit what we have in our current staffing, our current faculty portfolio, and how can we leverage, how can we devolve specific types of duties and responsibilities so that we can provide the kinds of efficiencies, the kinds of effectiveness in order to meet uh, the process, uh, the processes that we would like uh, to happen uh, more effectively and so forth. With regard to uh, staffing is to optimize on the use of existing staffers in order to address these particular uh, uh, critical needs that we, we have addressed in terms of processes. With regard to the faculty portfolio, recognizing that there are only so many slots available for tenured faculty. How can we address the growth in demand for our courses, the growth in demand for our programs, and yet uh, not sacrifice on the quality, the integrity of these academic programs? That is, we uh, need to address how the units can creatively revamp the portfolio of the current faculty makeup with regard to supplementing with non-tenured non track full-time faculty, with adjunct faculty, with existing tenured faculty, and to assure that the programs are sustainable and yet not sacrificing on the academic quality component. Exponentially growing the connectivity of the university. Now that has implications with regard to access to increased grant funding and certainly recognizing the university as a major, not just regional player, but global player in terms of connectivity and being that hub for uh, access to a number of other types of activities with regard to research, uh, particularly in light of our F-score grants and other grants that have come through our grants portfolio and so forth. Our uh, chief information officer has uh, been uh, immersed in terms of uh, contacts that are not just uh, with our local education institutions and not just with our government and, and, and military and other types of organizations on island, our private corporations, but also with partners across higher education institutions, research education networks, and whatnot. Understanding financial sustainability in all programs, activities, and services. Every unit head is now being made more accountable. I, I, I joke about the use of the good to great four-way test in reviewing any new initiatives, in reviewing existing initiatives. The four-way test goes back and asks the questions. Is it fit to the great mission of the University of Guam? Is it going to represent high quality? Is it going to be sustainable? Does it have a relevant demand component? And if the answer is no on any one of those four components, then they failed the test. And so that's something that uh, continues to be uh, an ongoing uh, commitment as far as uh, educating uh, the members of our university citizenry and so forth. And finally, improving and revising administrative and assessment processes to include the use of big data. Now big data, uh, we think about a lot of data that already exists 
a lot of data that we don't or haven't paid attention to, and how does that translate to uh, meaningful assessments, meaningful analysis to tell the story of what else we need to be doing in order to make improvements. And so uh, one of the things that we uh, are very mindful of is strengthening our institutional research efforts, and not just internally, but also looking at other parts of our community, particularly uh, with the, uh, the pipeline of education, and, and trying to understand the story better so that we can be even more accountable in terms of turning out the types of intellectual capacity that we need to grow our island and, and grow our region. Okay. And so we recognize the challenges, but how do we address the, uh, the growth trajectory that is meaningful and that is targeted? So the strategic initiatives resulting in the exponential growth for grant opportunities, it goes back to our hedgehog of what are we passionate about, what is relevant with regard to uh, regional intent, and certainly how can we make sure that it is uh, sustainable. The University of Guam has now become a major national player in terms of access to a large amount of grant portfolio. We've seen, we've demonstrated that with the National Science Foundation funded EBSCOR multi-year grant. Uh, we've demonstrated that with many other grants that have been uh, ongoing and that we are now funneling through our RCEOG entity. And, and, and also with, uh, I know that we're not supposed to announce it, but the U24 multi-year $2.7 million grant that is also going to build capacity in understanding risk uh, mitigating factors as it relates to cardiometabolic, cardiovascular types of diseases, diabetes, and whatnot, using not just our faculty experts, but also students being involved in the data gathering piece and helping as well to build that information literacy, data gathering capacity that's going to be helpful, not just for our island, but also for our region. And so uh, the, the, the fact that we are engaging students in this process allows us to tap into a much larger pool of that capacity uh, on our campus in order to uh, go after uh, new opportunities as well to grow those initiatives. The second bullet, enhancing student experience and student success. Uh, raising graduation rates has always been a goal, but we have more targeted efforts uh, through the Student Success Innovation Team, which I will talk about in the next slide, in order to address that. I, I often uh, speak to our administrators about the need to provide uh, a positive return on taxpayers' dollars. The investments that are made uh, by families, the investments that are made uh, by our, our local appropriations to assure that students not only persist through their academic journey at the University of Guam, but they actually come out, come out with a credential. It's been a national issue across the United States, and certainly Guam you know, is a part of that, that issue, but uh, I'm, I'm really, really very pleased with the team support that we have in place in order to address growing the, the graduation <laughs> rates. And of course, the goal should always be 100% completion. Okay. And so the national averages are roughly around 50%. I said, we're better than that. And we have the capacity in order to assure that. Enhancing the student experiences in terms of, okay, so what else can we do uh, with a new Triton athletic director and a new uh, Triton uh, basketball team? We also have tryouts that are, going, uh, that are going to be happening for a women's and men's soccer teams. And so we're going to see a lot of uh, uh, activity with regard, uh, and, and certainly uh, not just the Triton spirit, but also the island spirit in terms of seeing more intramural types of uh, uh, engagement through sports. The Triton mobile app is going to be uh, 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 a breathtaking addition to what we're doing. We're going to be launching that sometime in the fall. It's a way to give students immediate access to uh, current and new information about funding, availability, about tutoring, about mentoring, and also with regard to what's going on with campus safety, what's going on in terms of other types of assistance that they need in order to, to make them feel uh, really good uh, and safe at our institution. And of course, that leads to campus security as well with a lot of our efforts that have been uh, 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 solidified in order to assure uh, that the University of Guam is, is a, 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 a very safe campus to be at. 
Customer service improvements will be made across all units, and that, you know, uh, our one-stop student services center that is uh, being rolled out this fall, make it uh, so that it's streamlined, and, and then students don't have to worry about, you know, one other thing, getting into courses or being able to complete uh, the semester and complete their program. The online bookstore as well is another way to streamline and provide access to affordable options for our students and certainly for faculty to make uh, strategic decisions about learning resources that the students will be obtaining. Data to drive decisions requires technology upgrades and, and, and so increased bandwidth is certainly a, a, has been a priority by our, our, our chief information officer and his team and uh, already through some negotiations we've managed to increase that. Uh, uh, certainly uh, the students are very pleased about that and with the faculty and the kinds of research and students engaging in those types of research as well, uh, that has been uh, a major priority for us. We're looking forward to the, uh, the development of a strategic IT plan and so that's forthcoming as well. Uh, processes being automated and streamlined again uh, through electronic workflows to, you know, uh, reduce uh, paper and, and certainly make, make things uh, more smooth in terms of moving through the pipelines. Uh, a shining star, the Research Corporation of the University of Guam, we saw an increase of 28% uh, since last year in the number of grants that are in their grants portfolio being managed by RCOG. We've also seen a growth in terms of the total grants amount. Uh, uh, since last year, uh, we, we saw from 11 million to a total of 16.7 million of the grants being managed under that portfolio. And so as a result of that, uh, we're hoping to see uh, an ultimate uh, diminished reliance on the subsidy from the local appropriation and, and, and perhaps in a couple of years we'll probably see that disappear in terms of reliance on the local uh, subsidy. Uh, the goal has always been to make it uh, a, a way in which we can uh, manage our grants more efficiently, more effectively, and certainly ultimately to be self-sustaining. So uh, much work has, has taken place in order to assure all of that. And so with that, we hope that uh, uh, the strengths that we've identified will uh, help to contribute to this uh, uh, growth trajectory that, that I've just covered. Student experience, a lot of these are interrelated. Uh, a student-centric view of, of, of how we deal with our students to assure high student achievement in their courses, in their programs, and make sure that the uh, targeted and intrusive advisement efforts are, are, are strengthened. Uh, help students uh, become successful and graduate. Uh, a lot of different types of, ex of experiences have been introduced aside from the research experiences. There's also travel opportunities uh, that are, are subsidized or even made affordable to our students. Uh, the high impact practices from the get go, uh, you know, we've already had that uh, being developed under the student success innovation team. Uh, working to improve the pipeline of students coming into the university, that is being done by virtue of our stronger partnership with the Guam Department of Education. Aside from the dual enrollment uh, program that we have over the summertime uh, that, that uh, provides uh, access to, uh, to English and, and math courses to uh, juniors in high school, we also implemented the Summer Triton Bridge program. The Summer Triton Bridge program allowed the uh, graduating high school seniors uh, access to a pathway in order to be better prepared for the fall semester. So we had 81 students participate in the summer bridge program uh, with the uh, pretest of the English placement. Uh, we had approximately 58% uh, place in college level English, which is amazing. The goal after they complete summer session C is that there'll be uh, a much higher percentage of them uh, ready to take the next uh, college level and those who do not place a college level for them to be ready to take college freshman courses. And again, it coincides with our intent to uh, improve upon the completion pathway from six years down to five years and down to four years, but also to avoid the stopout rates uh, that, that tend to come in uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the other uh, uh, 
type of uh, successful interaction is uh, last year we talked about uh, testing uh, ninth graders at George Washington High, ninth graders. And so uh, none of them place at uh, college level English. Uh, they will be uh, airmarked for testing as juniors in spring of 2017. This past spring, we administered the English placement test to ninth graders at Tejan High School, uh, and then we intend uh, to uh, test uh, ninth graders at the other high schools as part of that ongoing study. And uh, that is intended to help us uh, understand uh, where students are and to develop a closer type of relationship with the in terms of addressing the curricula and professional development uh, for uh, language arts and, and reading uh, teachers uh, by virtue of that partnership. Uh, we're also very excited about uh, how the University of Guam, through its knowledge uh, experts, can contribute to uh, professional development for common core and career readiness types of content areas. And so that discussion has been ongoing uh, since last semester. And we're also very excited about the opportunity to leverage uh, the uh, knowledge experts in the development of uh, 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 content area types of uh, supplemental curricula that is regionally uh, relevant and so forth. Uh, preparing 21st century graduates, here we've got a number of competencies including the need to have them be uh, relevantly engaged, uh, uh, develop those collaborative, analytic, uh, quantitative, critical thinking, facile communicators, uh, those who are technologically adept and globally competitive. And so, uh, you know, there ought not to be a, another choice with regard to being able to develop those in order to, to, to have that cohort, that continuous cohort of, of, of uh, uh, young professionals and other types of professionals that can contribute to the growth of our community as well as our economy. Uh, focusing financial aid to where it's needed most through our student uh, financial assistance programs, we've been very, very strategic with regard to providing those relevant needs in those professional areas, academic programs, uh, as well as some of the uh, innovative types of uh, initiatives for uh, student retention efforts and degree completion efforts, uh, the incentive uh, to new freshmen to complete within three academic semesters and go on to your sophomore year, as well as uh, the incentive to complete your degree in, uh, in, in, in four years. We also have funding uh, for uh, research and teaching assistance uh, so that we can provide a way to uh, supplement the types of uh, uh, assistance that we need in our, our labs, in our courses, at the same time enabling students who want to engage in active research to be able to continue in their academic uh, program pathway. Uh, finally, expanding student horizons emphasize community engagement. Uh, again, uh, the overall student experience is something that we've been wanting to, uh, to advocate and, and promote and to make sure that the practicums, the capstone courses, the field research, uh, the research projects, the thesis and whatnot all have relevance to the types of solutions that we'd like to see come out of the great works of our University of Guam students at the graduate level as well as the undergraduate level. So overall, we can look to more exciting things. One of the, as you've been hearing, one of the key aspects of the Good to Great program has been financial sustainability and that uh, has done a lot with regards to prioritizing, that's the, the second point there, prioritizing our expenditures, making sure that we're spending money where it's it's going to the most use and so that the, the most popular uh, high demand programs are getting more resources and the lower demand resources, lower demand programs are getting fewer resources. The other thing we're also trying to do in addition to that is try to build up our financial resources so that we're able to weather uh, financial storms and we're currently in the middle of a financial storm uh, where we're really depleting all of our all of our uh, resources but we're we're trying to make sure that we've uh, we've got that so that we can we can weather a period where we're we're not getting much from the from the government um, we're doing a lot and we're the next couple slides are going to talk about some of our um, spending efficiency cost savings initiatives the, the you know before we 
start asking for additional funds, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we, we can with the funds that we're, that we're currently getting. We've talked about big data and um, we're trying to streamline more of our processes so that we are capturing all, all data from all transactions. We're not having any separate files apart from our computer system and apart from our big database so that we can tap on that database and make sure that decisions that we're making for allocating resources and for uh, spending for the future are all evidence-based uh, decision-making. We're not just, you know, putting our finger to the wind and saying this is where we think we should go. We want to make sure we have hard data for every, every decision that we're making. Um, we've talked a little bit about the increasing university revenue growth, diversifying the, the areas where we, can, where we can get revenue, decreasing our dependence on the, the funds that we get from the legislature. Um, and along with that, we've, we've been talking about some increases. We've had some, some very good wins really in the last, is it 12 months? About 12 months, we've had some uh, three pretty big wins on um, increasing our uh, financial aid that we get from the federal grants. And uh, we're, we're looking to expand that and, and to continue that. Um, just getting into some details of cost savings, we have gone through the campus uh, <clears throat> and we're continuing to go through the campus, but we've already seen some uh, progress from lighting initiatives trying to move towards LED. Um, we've gone through many of the buildings with uh, air conditioner upgrades. We've still got a few more buildings to go uh, trying to take advantage of new, newer technology that has higher efficiency ratings and is going to be able to reduce the, uh, the KWH um, that, we're, that we're expending for uh, all of our uh, operations. Um, we have, um, we've been going through a lot of our processes, trying to eliminate redundant steps, trying to streamline, trying to put things um, on the computer system that can be on the computer system, um, trying to streamline, get into an electronic signature program, uh, reducing the, the amount of paper that we're using, and um, those, those processes continue. We, we talk about the soft docs program that we've, we've purchased that is, is enabling us to uh, integrate better with our, uh, our financial systems so that uh, documents that our inputs to the financial system can be created in our soft doc system and then be processed right on into the, the financial system. And uh, the last item there, um, about, it was a little more than a year ago, we started a program to try to um, move um, all financial aid recipients to uh, an automated clearinghouse system where they give us a bank account and we we then are able to, as, as soon as the, the funds are available for release, we can just shoot them directly into their, their bank account through electronic funds transfer. And um, it's been slow, but we're, we're up to 40%, and we, we feel like we're at a, a point where we're increasing and growing the, um, uh, the number of, uh, of students that are doing that. We're expecting big increases in this next year. And then finally, I, we just wanted to show this slide showing um, our, the, the blue and red lines are our FY13 and 14 uh, KWH usage throughout the year. And a, a lot of work had been done with ERA funds to, to try to take advantage of uh, that opportunity to, to put in more efficient lighting, more efficient air conditioning. And you can see in FY15, there started to be a decrease where there's a, a pretty substantial decrease in the, the uh, KWH consumption throughout the campus, and that has continued into FY16. So it's a, a pretty marked uh, change from the, the steps that we've been taking. And the other thing that's in there is we, we have put in some solar panels. We're trying to put in some more solar panels to, to reduce the uh, dependence that we have on the electrical grid. And I'll turn it back to the president. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, SVP and VPAF. Just to, to wrap it up, just to kind of give a, a little insight into what, what is coming up 
uh, I, we are really pleased to report that we're going to um, uh, issue the RFP for the uh, new Student Services Center. We're calling it the Student Success Center and the Engineering Annex. So that RFP will be out. And so uh, we anticipate that uh, uh, construction will begin sometime in the upcoming academic year. And that will be a major game changer for a lot of things, one for engineering. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, we have a pre-engineering program. We have over 90 students. Um, when, when, when you have different kinds of programs, you get different kinds of students. So these students uh, wouldn't be at the University of Guam if we didn't have a pre-engineering program. And they're actually the most mathematically prepared students we have on Guam. They, uh, I like to say they changed the calculus on calculus because now we have like lots of calculus courses that are filled up that we, we, we need more, you know, we need more professors. And so this is, uh, so these are the kind of things. When we do the Student Success Center, uh, it's going to allow us to um, uh, provide more student services and, and, and centralize student services. And then it'll just change campus life to go in, in keeping with what the, the SVP has talked about, with athletics, with apps, with all the kinds of activities, community-based activities, we'll be able to do those things. We also are anticipating building an, an, an international dorm, which will actually be a dorm for both regular students and regional students, but also focus on uh, some uh, on, uh, students that we get uh, on a temporary basis. We have a program we call English Adventure Program, in which we're contracting uh, through uh, the PIP program. We have uh, almost 6,000 students a year come to our campus from foreign sources. A lot of people don't even know about this. And this English Adventure Program is being awarded uh, by ASCU, the Association of uh, American State Colleges and Universities, for having an exemplary, innovative international program. And we're re the university is receiving that award in October. So the international dorm will help us uh, go along further with this. And of course, we are anticipating that we need, we, we will fund that by the, the, the revenue that we generate from that. And so that's not additional revenue. Uh, the, F, uh, the fine arts theater is really, the, the next two priorities we have are the fine arts theater and the Triton Engagement Center. The Triton Engagement Center is an attempt to uh, move, knock down all the houses that you see in Dean Circle and build a structure on the cliff line and then house those activities and community engagement centers and nonprofits who pay rent <laughs> in those areas so that you would have that kind of Triton engagement feel to you would enhance that and you would have an opportunity again that would be largely self-funding but we're trying to figure that out and then the uh, fine arts theater um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the 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 the, the theater as well as the, uh, the music and the art program. And for that one, we're, we're anticipating that we could get that funded just primarily through the endowment, uh, given the right constellation of donors. And lastly, we want, of course, to continue to move to increased energy independence, which means that we want to sign uh, longer-term contracts with people who are going to help us do this. This is the reason why we, uh, we have proposed legislation. In order, in order for us to do an international dorm and in order for us to uh, engage in some, with someone in increased energy independence, uh, we have to be uh, given the opportunity to sign longer than a five-year contract because, you know, five-year contracts are not a su sufficient length for any investor to say, geez, I want to work with you for five years and recover all their investment in five years, which means we'll never have a contract. So that's that. And lastly, I just want to point out again our WASC accreditation success. Um, uh, it's an amazing record. I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of the work of the university. I'm very proud of the work of our accreditation uh, liaison officer, who's uh, Dr. Enriquez, as well as our previous accredited liaison officer, who was uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Helen Whippy. These, uh, this is, and, 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 and our relationship as WASC has changed entirely. Uh, Helen was put on an accreditation team. Anita was put on an accreditation team to visit Cal State Fresno. I've been asked to chair an accreditation team for University of Hawaii, Maui. So our whole relationship with WASC has really um, 
changed over these past few years because of the work of the university. Our reputation is solid. It's great. I just want to point that out. Of course, we're doing everything we can with our expenditures and uh, our evidence-based decision-making. Our cost-saving measures are making an impact. And the, just to restate again, and you know, uh, uh, the SVP announced it, that uh, we have a, a $2.7 million grant from National Institute of Health that was just awarded last week. We haven't really done a formal announcement. We're also getting an EPSCOR award from NASA. And so this is the first time we've ever gotten an award from NASA. And so when the constellation of how we're able to uh, conduct research and then feed that back, not just to professors, but to offer, uh, as, as, uh, as Anita has pointed out, the opportunity to do research assistance and graduate uh, uh, teaching assistance and for our graduate students means that we're growing our uh, graduate programs uh, at the same time. And um, the evidence-based uh, policy making is, is not possible without a really solid information, chief information officer and IT program. So we have that in place. We recruited someone who was a graduate of the University of Guam and who was an associate chief information officer at Cal State Fullerton. And so now we've recruited him and now he's changed the trajectory. Now we know that Guam is, is the landing point for six major undersea cables that gives us access to Europe through Japan, gives us access to big data, gives us access to all these things and the University of Guam in order to be able to become the repository of knowledge as well as to conduct research at a very detailed and almost minute by minute level that some of these research projects require needs enormous bandwidth. And we're, we're on the trajectory for that. We're conducting training. We're taking the lead. All of the community colleges in the region are coming to the university at the end of this month to participate in training that we're primarily organizing for that. And so the student demand, public confidence continues to, to uh, uh, drive growth. Uh, you know, I think you can see it in the sense of people are, you know, it used to be I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, if you asked some high school graduates and said, are you going to the unit, where are you going? They never admitted they were going to UOG. Now they're proudly admitting they're going to UOG. It's written in the, you know, when you, when you used to go, especially in private schools, people just said, oh, I'm going to university somewhere. Now they're putting the University of Guam. This is, a, this is not your grandmother's University of Guam. This is a very dynamic, uh, uh, interesting place in which uh, students are uh, in the main uh, finding their way. And so we continue to have issues and we continue to have problems. But I think that uh, the student demand and the public confidence is at an all time high. And that's the most gratifying uh, statistic that uh, we can offer. So thank you very much. And we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, your, staff, your management team that uh, has made an excellent presentation. Um, it really was an excellent presentation, but now that the media is here, I want to again <laughs> <laughs> commend and congratulate the University of Guam for hearing the pleas of this committee about the dire financial condition of the government and coming forth today with a budget that is actually less than last year's budget. And, um, I, and to be able to do with less and even with as little as we gave you and the reserves that are being withheld, <laughs> um, the excellent work that, 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 that the university is, is producing um, really speaks, as you put it, volumes for the university. And I commend you and the entire university community for all the, the great work that you have been doing. Before I go on, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of your oversight chair, the Speaker of the Guam Legislature, uh, Speaker Warren Pat. Um, next to her is Senator Espicio, Senator Underwood, Senator Espaldon. To my right, Senator Mary Torres Camacho, Senator Tony Adda, and uh, a proud alum of the University of Guam, <laughs> Senator Morrison. Um, I just have a few questions. Um, I think it's excellent, the programs that you're doing and the expansion that you're, you're having. 
and you talked about the fact that you want to try to move your graduates through into positions in the community. Uh, I think one of the greatest programs that you have for the university is the nursing program. The graduation rate, the passage rate for the NCLATs um, is second to none. Um, is there any way that that can be expanded? I mean, knowing the dire, I mean, dire, dire need for nurses in this community. Um, is there anything that can be done to, at least on a temporary basis, I, you know, I'm not sure you want to have put tenured professors on and not be able to, but for a short term to try to expand that program to try to meet the needs that this community is currently suffering. Well, I, I think that's a very important point, and I think uh, we will make every effort to expand the number of people that we admit to the program. Uh, just to, uh, just so that, uh, in general, just to explain, uh, you know, the, the university has two programs currently that have a third year entry point and require testing, and, and one is the School of Ed, which means now that we're producing much better prepared teachers, although fewer teachers than we ever have before because we're screening people out. And then secondly, the, the nursing. And, um, and then, you know, inevitably when we establish a full-fledged uh, engineering program, we'll have the same opportunity. But the, the nursing program is uh, an exemplary program. And I think that uh, uh, I, 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 I can't speak for the dean, but I think we'll hear your plea uh, very clearly. And we'll make every effort to uh, expand the number of uh, people that we're going to accept into the program. It is a very um, uh, intensive program. In order to maintain accreditation, you can't just have a class of 30 people. Some classes, especially at the upper levels, require very low uh, uh, teacher-professor uh, uh, student ratio. And so that's always an, uh, a little bit of an issue. But I think, uh, you know, given the situation that you've described, especially we know at the new hospital and the problems that they're having, and in general, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a very important point, and we'll do that. And with the um, new IT guru that you have, I'm hoping that <laughs> I know that many of your professors and, and many of your um, graduates are doing things online. I just can't figure out why we can't somehow, with what small faculty we have there, expand it to be able to address that need. Especially the classes that uh, don't demand in in uh, intensive uh, supervision, you know, because you have a lot of practicum courses. But as those courses that don't have, you know, more of that could be done through distance ed. Okay, if you could. Sure. But then on the opposite end, <laughs> and I'll probably get killed for this comment, but last week I had three hearings with public safety uh, departments. And they were unable to move, to, to fill vacancies. And I know that I've attended all of your commencements in the spring and in the, f in, in, um, uh, the fall. I guess it's the winter graduation, I'm not sure what you call it. Well, and even at GCC. And invariably, the largest group that stands up is criminal justice. And I'm trying to figure out, has, uh, I made the GCC do a study to try to figure out how many of their graduates have been picked up by public safety. The number of graduates with 22 this last year and 30 last year and about 30 the previous year. In the last three years, two. Now I know your CJ majors, some of them are using it for their promotion, but is there any way that somehow we could all get together to try to figure out how through the, what, the education of these young people that we can use the system that's there to take care of 80% of their courses and 
then have a specialized two month plus PT for the various public safety departments rather than have to run an eight month course or something. I, I'm just at wit's end trying to figure out what are we doing with all these graduates? I'm just, well, or should a, we continue to even? Uh, well, you know, you, you've asked a very important question because that's a question we've asked criminal justice. And it's, uh, there's about uh, three or four programs that we went through our prioritization process, and that's one of them that we're asking, what happens to, our, what happens to your graduates? Why do we have this program? What is the point of the program? And, uh, you know, at, at some level, of course, it's generally understood that entry-level positions into uh, public safety officers are actually uh, kind of uh, a Guam Community College uh, uh, activity, and that the criminal justice program is, uh, as you've indicated, uh, largely used by existing uh, police officers in order to get promoted to uh, high and get more pay. And so that seems to be a big part of the motivation. Of course, we tried to figure out, well, what is the relationship between a criminal justice degree and becoming a federal law enforcement officer? And, you know, in my conversations with uh, people who work in the FBI or in the Secret Service, they always tell me, the last thing we want is a criminal justice major. We'd rather have a major in psychology or a major in chemistry or, or something along those lines because it speaks uh, uh, slightly differently. So uh, that's a very important question. I, and I, I think that uh, one of the, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's really uh, two programs that we have at the university that are uh, being uh, pushed by, by us and by their respective deans in order to come up with an answer to that question of what happens to criminal justice majors. And there's another program that uh, is experiencing the same issue. The four-way test that, uh, that uh, the SVP spoke to is, uh, you know, is it financially sustainable? Is it a program of high quality? Does it meet our regional mission? And what is your demand relationship? And that's the, that's the issue that some of these programs are having. Well, you're graduating a lot of people. A lot of people like to go in your program. But what happens? What is the demand? What is the social value of that demand? That's a, uh, that's a, I, I don't want to say that uh, uh, we anticipated that question, but I think that question is uh, part of the series of questions that we're undergoing now. Thank you. Because I mean, the reason why I'm asking is that we just had the hearings last week, and the manpower shortage uh, at the at the three public safety departments, with the with the fact that they have um, their their overtime is just beyond control. I mean, three million dollars a year in overtime um, in one department. But they need to fill the vacancies, and they're just having a real difficult time filling their vacancies. And um, so I uh, just wanted to, to try to figure out if there's a way that we can all work together with GCC and the and the uh, maybe at some future time sit down at a round table with 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 the three of you to try to figure out exactly. What what is what is needed? I mean, I commend the university for the other things that they're they're doing, the new uh, engineering program and uh, um, the social science program, uh, the human services, uh, excellent. You know, but I, I'm just trying to figure out where we have the demand if we can somehow try to try to fill it. And um, so I thank you for um, I. I'm very happy that uh, RCUOG is doing well. <laughs> <laughs> we are too. <laughs> I didn't want my baby to be uh, to have problems. So anyway, I'll allow your uh, oversight chair to leave with questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the university. Uh, for your pre budget presentation. I'm definitely very happy to, s to hear that your costs have been uh, controlled 
and that cost-saving measures also are really actually making an impact at the university. I, I do have some questions, but I also want to re reiterate exactly what the vice speaker had, had stated because of that uh, recent public hearing. I was very happy that when the bill came down to the legislature, it's law now, when you decided to reform uh, scholarships. And I reviewed to see where the monies, you know, are going. And I know that the university, every so often, submits a, a form to the community asking the community leaders, uh, both private and public sector, to indicate what we feel uh, are needed in the community, and the university would respond accordingly. And and I know that at least with the teaching positions, is the the shortage of teachers have responded uh, very well uh, with that when you made some reforms. Uh, uh, thank you for that. I, I agree about the dire need for nursing. As you know, GRMC is having a difficult time re recruit, recruiting because of the new immigration policy. And, uh, and, and I'm hoping, yes, that something could be done. So the priority definitely are in nursing and, of course, still with teaching. However, there are, uh, I consider, some uh, needs as well. We met with um, the Superior Court judge, and there's a new program that they are going to start. And they're saying that what they would really like the university to respond to the program in terms of preparing uh, inmates, uh, you know, to go out into the community will be more people in, uh, in social service, social sciences, you know, social workers, sociology, psychology, and uh, and he basically, you know, said that uh, he wished that the university would uh, consider uh, that program. What I would like um, to ask you is where you are specifically. I know I read and followed your your presentation with your research center. Uh, I know we had a bill recently also that was passed into law to assist you with personnel and it's supposed to be a money maker, you know, a revenue resource as well for the university. Can you tell us where are we with that? And Yes, the uh, research uh, center, uh, the research corporation, University of Guam, uh, uh, we've indicated that we have uh, 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 a number, I think we're up to 28 programs that are being run through the research corporation. Um, right now, it has about a $370,000 subsidy. Uh, we're going to rearrange internally the indirect cost rate because when the grant comes in and we have indirect costs, it's divided inside the university in different ways. Now we're going to divide it so that a big chunk of it goes to RCUOG. So starting, we anticipate that with the concurrence of the Board of Regents, uh, that we would shave off about 250 to 260 thousand dollars of that subsidy as of October 1st, uh, simply through rearranging the indirect costs, which would then allow us actually to spend more money to get more grants and more contracts. So the more grants and contracts we have, actually the more uh, they're able to charge and the more they're able to uh, generate revenue for the entire university. So I think it's in, it's in uh, very good shape. I think it's, uh, it, it, you know, you, the, the institutional capacity of the university uh, to acquire grants and contracts is facilitated by having a unit where you can hire people quickly where you can do procurement quickly. And that's the, the point of the RCUOG, because the other processes require us are very cumbersome. So that's why, so, so you know, for years, the standard, uh, you know, uh, kind of practice at the University of Guam was that if you had a small grant, let's say you just had a small grant for $15,000 and you wanted to hire a student and pay them $2,000 to work on your grant, it would take you six months to go through that process because we just, the, there were just a number of, of processes and rules and requirements. Once we created the RCUOG, these students are now hired in two weeks. So now that, that grant applicant, that PI, that principal investigator, is now free to write more grants, more contracts. And so that's the success that's building upon it. So we anticipate that within another year, uh, the subsidy will be entirely limited. 
you just went right into my second question, exactly that with the indirect cost, because I'm looking at all of your um, funding sources that you're able to receive, like you said, anywhere from 15,000 to 100 percent federal grants. And currently, where do those indirect costs go? And how much of that? And would it be all of your uh, grants that will be able to go into RC, or is it just specific uh, grants? Uh, well, not, not all grants have indirect costs, so that's the first issue. But the ones that do, uh, they could go to RCUOG depending on the decision of the, the PI, whether, whether it's necessary. Now, the indirect cost that we get, you know, is currently divided, uh, you know, Part of it goes to VPAF because the point of indirect costs is that uh, you're, the university is, uh, is, is paying something for hosting this grant, but it's not really directly charged, so therefore you indirectly charge it. And so that's seen as, uh, by many universities, as kind of a, a profit margin, or uh, in our case, uh, we give 16% uh, of it to the VPAF because their business services, their facility services uh, that are provided in order to host the grants and contracts. Uh, some of it goes back to the original, uh, the originating unit because they can use that money uh, to pay for travel because nobody gets travel. Uh, go to conferences, buy specialized equipment that they wouldn't ordinarily be able to get. So that's a decision that we push back on the unit. A big chunk comes to my office. And that's how, this is basically how we're able to provide opportunities for... Uh, we don't get any money to run the Board of Regents. We don't get any money to put up any institutional uh, initiatives. So just as a way of explanation, the EBSCOR grant, which is the major grant the university has received, you know, we had to spend probably about $70,000 in order to get the right constellation of people involved, get the right consulting, right, get in the right organizations. So that's part of that kind of strategic initiatives uh, that we go through. And that's the, the, uh, the, the president's strategic initiatives is the account that uh, is, uh, that, that goes to, uh, well, you know, under the new policy, the president's strategic initiatives are going to have to be less strategic <laughs> and less initiative because the amount's going to go down and uh, much of it's going to go to the uh, RCUOG, which is where it belongs, I think. Thank you. Um, on your upcoming projects in which you want to generate some revenues, where uh, I didn't see anything about uh, the hatchery, and you had mentioned that there was a possibility of a public-private partnership. Where are you with that? Well, uh, we we can do that, but it's also kind of like part of the uh, the legislation that we were proposing that allows us to do more than a five-year deal. <laughs> then we can do that because it's hard to do a private-public partnership with a private firm that you're basically asking to recover all their investment in five years. That's the issue. So I think the logic behind the uh, legislation that I, I think uh, uh, Randy uh, uh, proposed is, is part of that is the hatchery. Uh, we, we have uh, basically uh, three kinds of projects in mind in, to be uh, part of that uh, legislation. One is the hatchery. One is uh, a long-term uh, a lease buyback arrangement for an international dorm, and the other, the other is uh, energy independence. Because you know we've been talking to different firms about uh, just setting up a, a, an independent uh, a kind of a power grid, mini power grid on our own, uh, which is also a possibility, but not really if it's going to uh, uh, it's, if it's limited to five years. So yes, we do have that in mind, uh, Senator. Okay, and lastly, um, with the uh, your solar energy, and I know at one time you had considered, and I don't know if it's uh, the wind windmill. Uh, you know, are your your savings? Uh, what are you doing for savings? Is it going right back to do more efficient type of energy resources or what have you? And how much of that have you seen a you know, in terms of your savings? I, D yeah, yeah. Go ahead and bring it up. DOI gave us nine hundred thousand dollars. I think we're gonna make we're gonna save nine hundred thousand dollars in the course of uh, 
I think by 2018, 2019, their investment would have been worth it. Uh, the, the point on, on that is that when we're able to save the money, we then reinvest it into new air conditioning systems, which in turn save us more money. And, you know, if you've been to the field house lately, you notice it's a much more comfortable place if you've been to any building there. And because of all of these kinds of things that we're, we're plowing back into the facilities. So uh, uh, it's a... It's a kind of a good news for the university, maybe not so good news for the power company, I don't know, you know, but uh, we're, we're trying to figure out ways to, uh, to make that work. Of course, that's why we hired Randy from GPA. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this graph, it, it, it shows the, the blue and red lines are from mm -hmm. FY 13 and 14, and it, um, it's showing what we looked like for KWH usage before the energy savings initiative started, and then you can see the, the light green and the purple are showing what has happened after we've been implementing uh, conversions to LED and uh, more efficient air, air conditioning units, as well as policies throughout the campus to turn lights off when you leave, keep doors closed, try to keep, keep air from, from escaping out. So um, it's, a, it's a pretty significant um, savings, we've that's offset because we're we're using buildings more, more and later into the <clears throat> evenings than we we had before, but um, we are taking those savings and we're um, trying to expand our LED programs, um, and we're continuing. We've we've still got uh, we have several buildings left to go where we need to replace uh, air conditioning and. We should see additional additional savings from that. Thank you, and thank you very much uh, for you. taking the lead. And I, it's always heartwarming to know if education institutions are actually taking the lead right now in terms of where we are financially uh, to either come in with a budget at the same level or even slightly lower. So yeah. thank you so much. The, the only problem with coming in with a lower budget is that's what you're likely to get. <laughs> <laughs> But I do, I do want to thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, for allowing us the flexibility on, uh, on SFAP because that has allowed us to build graduate programs. It allowed us to uh, do the kinds of initiatives that the SVP talked about, you know, which is like, look, if you graduate in four years, we'll give you $1,000. And then people are thinking, well, I'm going to graduate in four years. They, you get different motivational factors. We don't know whether that's really going to work out exactly as we thought. But, you know, if it doesn't, we'll change it. We'll change the trajectory and we'll try something else. But without that flexibility, we wouldn't have been able to kind of conceptualize uh, uh, different innovative strategies. Thank you, um, Mr. Vice Speaker. I, I'm also encouraged by your presentation. And I know, Dr. Underwood, you're always a long-term strategic uh, kind of thinker. I'm wondering if several years ago you've purposely requested for a higher budget so that over the years you can, <laughs> you can kind of just come into where exactly you uh, need to be, but it's much higher than where you want nobody, to be. <laughs> nobody's, that, nobody's that clever. Nope. <laughs> nobody but you. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, generate a smile, actually. I. I think you've raised the bar, uh, and the other agencies that are watching are wondering, why did <laughs> UOG have to be one of the first? <laughs> Should be uh, among the last. But, you know, I also want to say um, uh, to the panel, Mr. Chair, that their good to great framework uh, is working. Because for the last several months, I've been working with uh, one of your uh, shining stars, uh, Dr. Austin Shelton. And uh, you were right on point where you said that you've encouraged the professors or even the faculty staff administration to not only identify the programs they want, but to try to figure out some creative ways to uh, fund it. And as a result of the uh, sustainability conference that you've had uh, over the last several years, and congratulations to uh, that success as well, uh, Dr. Austin has generated um, a plan uh, that might give us uh, additional opportunity to bring the university to a C grant college uh, level where potentially you could match that uh, dollar for dollar. 
And uh, <clears throat> I, I'm very respectful of UOG's autonomy. I'm very uh, respectful of WASC. So I didn't want to come out and introduce the bill uh, to try to appropriate money from the general fund uh, to create this uh, sustainability coordinators that he is trying to put together uh, that's con in support of the environmental goals outlined in the zero waste program and to provide a sustained technical resources to address river erosion, flood control, and concerns related to climate change. So I'm looking forward to any ideas or guidance you may have. I understand the concern that if the $500,000 was piggybacked to the university's budget and the university did not get what it was requesting, that puts you in a very uh, tenuous, position, tenuous position to try to figure out what the what the priorities will be at that point so I just you know I just put it out there uh, mr. chairman because the university has been successful in leveraging local funds to get federal funds uh, and and also the work that we did to uh, require the Bureau of Statistics and plans to not only update the southern master plan but to uh, deal with all the erosion problems faced in the south uh, dr. Shelton uh, his whole graduate project and his graduate studies is something that that they're implementing now to capture the silt and to prevent uh, erosion control could you speak a little bit to that because if there is a opportunity in this budget process I'd, I'd like to keep uh, raising well I, issue. I, I would say Senator Respicio we never turn away money uh, and uh, but uh, you know that's a kind of a, a partially also decision on your part as a legislature to figure out how does this fit into other priorities uh, but you know dr. Shelton uh, uh, motivation and uh, his energy is uh, is uh, is very welcome and uh, he uh, his work on uh, on the uh, uh, that that process has been uh, excellent it was part of his dissertation he's now uh, he's now come on campus and he's generating new ideas and and we, we just we're, we're happy that we have these uh, uh, these uh, young people who grew up here uh, coming back you know uh, when I was uh, when I when when he was a student at UH I spoke to him a couple of times while on, on my trips through UH and uh, he said you know at, at, at first he wasn't thinking of coming back to Guam that he was gonna go somewhere else but I wouldn't say that he he did say you know I, I love good to great because I figured out he could he could do that but but his work on Sea Grant and our status to change our status to Sea Grant which he he worked the the director of Sea Grant came out here and and uh, he basically shadowed her for a couple of days she gave me an exit report that was very glowing and uh, you know very appreciative and so now we have Sea Grant with the NASA Next is Space Grant. <laughs> so. Yeah, I was able to meet with her uh, so the, in my office. Gonna get, and then we're going to get a NASA grant. So now Space Grant is now kind of in the thinking because the Space Grant is really a community development program where you're inviting students to go to space camp. And then you're kind of expanding their horizons. So all of these things are, you know, are are doable as long as the university kind of contextualizes it and is allowed the opportunity to contextualize it. So it's, it's a very, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, Dr. Shelton came in at the right time for that. In your slide that showed the uh, UOG projects, uh, I'm guessing that that's consistent with your budget proposal? Yes, it is. Yeah, and it's, so if you get the budget that you're asking for, those are the projects you would. Uh, That's right, remember. and and the, and, the, and most of these upcoming projects are self-sufficient, anyways. But they're just you, we just want you to know that these are unless some tragedy I, befalls the government of Guam, and I hope that doesn't happen. Because I I wanted <laughs> to. Uh, these things are in place, and and they're in place under existing law and existing uh, funding arrangements. Because I want to work with, uh, continue to work with this committee and with the university to add another bullet point to add funding for the development and expansion of Sea Grant College programs. Okay. So if you could generate some thoughts on how we could uh, get All there. Right. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll yield to my colleagues because I think I can ask the President. <laughs> 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 I, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it was an excellent presentation, and I tell you the truth, I expected nothing less. Uh, I, I, I've heard and I've talked to a lot of people at UOG and all the things that are going on up there, uh, and it was, it's all very encouraging. Um, a lot of good things were said. A lot of questions have already been asked that I was going to go down the road, and, but I want to perhaps re just reiterate uh, what the chairman has kind of stated, the whole nursing program, I really believe there's a real big necessity uh, to focus in on that. Uh, I believe you already know that. We're stating the obvious to you. But again, just to make clear that on this side of this table, we also acknowledge there's a big need. And, and, th and there are some real uh, um, rewarding careers in that field. So it, it accomplishes many things. So when you start talking about um, you know, what can, and in fact, you ask that question, or you, you pose that question, that's one that you asked yourselves, what can UOG be great at? And again, we know the success of this program up at UOG, it may be worthy, again, to, to continue upon the strength that, that you have and perhaps expand it. I think it's very important for the community. Uh, the other one I need to try to understand, we know that there's a big movement going back into farm to table type uh, uh, programs that, that are out there in the community and I know there's a lot more people who really want to get into it and I just wanted to know if that is one of those areas uh, that you, you foresee that you would probably expand upon uh, because Randy did say that you know those uh, those programs that are in high demand get more funding those in low demand get less funding and, and I understand that mindset however that not might not be the real uh, conclusive, uh, conclusive approach in, in that because there may be some programs that may have some good interest but because the funding is not adequate then your program's not adequate and people don't go to it. Uh, but I'm just wondering in terms of the agricultural department and I know there's some good work coming out of there. I've read some articles about Dr. Galabi and a few others uh, of the work they're doing. Is there any plans, are there any plans to perhaps uh, put more focus on that so we become more self-reliant. Well, you're uh, uh, just uh, briefly on the, uh, on the nursing issue and, and just to, again, uh, reiterate the kind of changes that are occurring uh, in, in that unit. It's the School of Nursing and Health Sciences. So now the health science majors are actually outnumbering the nursing majors in that, in that school. And then we have these, uh, the, the cancer grant, which just got renewed. And then we have this NIH grant that uh, Dr. Enriquez mentioned. And so we have more resources and more oomph to that. And actually, that's going to help, in general, improve the health conditions on the island. But I hear you very loud and clearly on the specific need for nurses. That I, 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 is very clear. And also in that unit, uh, social work is in there, too. So, you know, that's like our... Uh, uh, a unit that is, uh, that school is really uh, uh, meeting direct needs of, of people uh, on the island in, in very direct ways. And uh, we have a very robust cooperative extension service. And almost every activity that you hear that involves the farmers has an advocate in there. And most often that advocate is a professor at the University of Guam. So, you know, helping fund, helping frame, helping uh, plan out agriculture, almost, uh, you know, uh, every activity that you hear about, there's a cooperative extension agent from the University of Guam working there. And so, you know, so, and then the, uh, the, the we used to have a specific major in agriculture, but it's been combined with uh, consumer science, and now that major is back on a growth cycle, again, because it's, it's seen more broadly in your, in your frame it's not just seen as somebody learning how to run a ranch. It's, seen, it's someone seen as how do you make the island more sustainable? How do you improve family life? How do you improve health choices? How do you improve food choices? And so we even had a, uh, one of our professors uh, study how to uh, uh, make Keleguin that doesn't go bad so quickly, you know, and which is uh, really helpful, you know, because not only helpful on uh, the one end, people don't get sick, but on the other end, uh, people are able to eat Kelleguin. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that answer. Uh, and I, I tell you, the, the answer, the, the response uh, in terms of the cooperative extension agents uh, being out there is important. And I say that because I, 
in a past life I was a farmer and I rely and it was in Hawaii and I re relied extensively on them to help me design uh, irrigation systems to help me uh, understand you know the chemical components uh, and how to use them properly and things like that so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, even that becomes a, a good focus for the university um, when it comes to graduation rates I just need to ask and 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 uh, uh, I know that it was said that, that the graduation rate now is in the 57 percentile or, or 17 percent, something like that. No. no. Yes. Is no, it higher, no. lower? Lower. Is it lower? lower? But that's one of the objectives to, to that's increase right. it. That's right. right. It's at 30 uh, percent. The most current uh, figure is 30 percent. And so uh, with big data, <laughs> institutional research efforts and whatnot, and targeted uh, uh, student support services through advisement under our student success innovation initiatives that uh, the goal is a hundred percent of course right the goal was 35 percent for many years and I never understood that so we're, so we're, we're raising the bar <laughs> <laughs> we're raising the bar so uh, we're very excited because uh, it's a more of a uh, an ecosystem approach to how we're doing it as opposed to just reserving the efforts to one unit on campus. So it's a collective uh, type of uh, effort that we're seeing uh, across our university uh, community. So we're very excited about that. And, the, and, and that's, a, that's an excellent question because the, uh, you know, just to, to, to put it into context, uh, the national average is around 50%. Oh, okay, so national and the national goal is 60%. Mm. And so, you know, uh, people kind of like, how does that work? You mean lots of people go to college and never finish? Yes, that's, ab that's the absolute truth. And, uh, you know, there's some, uh, with the use of big data, we're going to be able, like, for, for example, when people uh, tell me, uh, they stop me in the market and they say, you know, I told my son, it's okay to go to UOG now. Go there for a couple of years and then you can go on to the States. And I'm thinking... I don't want to tell them, well, that messes up our graduation rate because <laughs> they're coming and they're never going to graduate from UOG. They might graduate somewhere else. And so I don't want to get into the details of don't mess up our graduation rate. But, you know, that is one of the statistics. So the good news on, on, on that part is that uh, we did get up to 30%. We went up 3% in one year as a result of some of these initiatives. And, and you can tell in our trajectory when I started off, we're actually getting more students graduating than, we're, than are entering, which means uh, it's a really good sign now. So we're, 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 we're getting them out of, the, uh, out of the system. But we're ahead of our peer institutions. Every institution, uh, you know, is required, uh, kind, sort of required to have institutions that you aspire to be and institutions that are like you. Well, the institutions that are like us, uh, we have 10 of them, you know, they're institutions that are open admission and that are publicly funded. Now, we're better than all of them, <laughs> but, you know, that's not good enough for us. But, but it's a, and so the, the, the college completion rate is, uh, is, uh, is one of the signature things. Uh, the loan default rate, you know, uh, how many of your students are not paying their debts? That's another, uh, 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 as well as, uh, you know, access. So it used to be that the emphasis was, how many students are you providing access to? Now the, the, the issue is how many students are you actually graduating? And then the other element too is the, uh, what do they actually know? Which is the question about critical thinking. So when we go back to the degree programs, we ask them, how many of your students are graduating? And it used to be some programs say, oh yeah, we got 30 majors, but you know, we only, only two were worthy of graduating. And I say, well, that sucks, that doesn't, that doesn't carry water anymore. If they're in your, ma your job is to help them graduate, you know. But they also have to meet the requirements of a general degree. So the, the assessment that the, the SVP is talking about applies to all degree programs. You have to be a critical thinker no matter what your degree program is. You have to be technologically competent no matter what your degree program is. And that's being applied to all degrees now. And so that's the, that, that's the coherence, the meaning of degree, as well as the responsibility of people who manage programs to, you know, facilitate uh, their development. I appreciate that. The, uh, and, and, I'm, and 
that was that was a, a great response. If, if I could just add, though, and this was a concern raised to me by several students uh, uh, at UOG, um, is that one of the problems they face of being able to graduate, which really kind of impedes their ability to keep moving forward on a on a timely basis, is the unavailability of classes yeah. for the next step. And you know, they take it. They take a class. Uh, expecting uh, in the fall, expecting that in spring they could go on to the next class and move forward. But then, come springtime, that availability availability of that class is not there, and so they almost have to take some time off uh, just to kind of fill that space and time, and, and wait for that class to become available. And I'm sure you're aware of it, but I just want to make sure that we're aware of it. Yeah. And going forward it has to be addressed all right so part of uh, part of good to great were uh, were two things one is the sequencing of classes so that when we said to programs you have to have 124 credit hours because there were BA programs that required 136 credit hours there were BA programs that required 120 there were BA programs and I said well those, those are not BAs those are MAs almost so you know you, ha you, you have to make decisions narrow your, your focus, make sure your degree is clear, and then provide a plan that somebody can actually graduate in four years. If you, if you can't provide that plan, then that catalog is, uh, is not a contract, and that catalog is supposed to be a contract. So that's... Uh, okay, well... So I, 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 and and if, if anyone hears that this is going on, please let me or the SVP knows, because that's that's a definite no-no in this process <laughs> because we're trying to make sure that the, the degree is clear, it's meaningful, and it's achievable in four years. And, and I appreciate that because, and I'm, that's why I'm saying it, because my kids are college age. My daughter came back from the States to go back to university, she asked my permission. And I guess in the old days, I would have said no. <laughs> and that was almost the running joke in that family when we were growing up, right? That's if right. you don't study hard, you might end up at College of Guam. <laughs> and, you know, and I was like, oh, gosh, we don't want to go there, right? <laughs> but it, the opposite is true now. You know, the, the college has now turned to the university. There have been some great strides. We see this thing blossoming. And it should be the natural choice. And it has been for my daughter. She, was, she went abroad, came back, and wanted to be, do it here. She, she felt it was probably a stronger program than where she was at. Uh, and, now, and when she graduates, uh, her home university won't get credit for her, her, their graduation. <laughs> 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 but the, the point is that there, I have a lot of young people that come to my house, and they sit around, we talk about it, because I always follow up with them, too. How are you doing in school? Where are you going on this? And things like that. We have those conversations. And again, the unavailability of class is one of the issues that comes up frequently. Uh, it stops them kind of cold at a certain point and say, well, now we just have to wait for another year before we can even, before we even know uh, whether we can take the next class up. Um, another question that I guess I need to try to f fully understand, that, you know, is, is just the, there are students, again, in my, that come to my house and they aren't necessarily at UOG, but they're at GCC. And so I need to try to understand, and, and some of them are very dismayed that some of the credits that they've taken at GCC are not transferable to UOG. And I just want to try to understand what is that relationship between uh, the ability of students who, again, perhaps start off at GCC for whatever reason, whether it's a financial reason, whether it's a, a reason uh, because of they, need, they feel they need to perhaps become more proficient in certain areas before they go on to, to the university level. And some of them have said, yeah, we haven't been able to transfer some of those credits. So I, I just need to understand, is that indeed a fact or is that, and, and if it is, then what is, where are we going with this? Uh, the university uh, ha has an articulation agreement with, the, with uh, the Guam Community College, the same manner it does have with the other regional colleges uh, like College of Micronesia, Micronesia NMC, Palau Community College, and so forth. Uh, so it is evident in both the uh, GCC's catalog as well as the University of Guam's undergraduate catalog what courses are transferable. And so what's very critical is that the students have a, a, an advisor that, that helps navigate them through that academic roadmap. We have what we call, uh, what is known in higher ed as swirlers, 
these are students who sort of go, you know, between the, uh, the two-year college and the university to take courses in order to satisfy prerequisites and whatnot. Uh, in our case, on Guam, uh, GCC's tuition is, is slightly lower than the University of Guam, or it could very well be that students need prerequisites that they prefer to take at the Guam Community College in order to, uh, you know, progress in their uh, degree pathway at the University of Guam. Nonetheless, uh, the notion of, of uh, providing better services to our transfer student is, is certainly a priority for us. We currently have in place with GCC a reverse transfer agreement. And in that regard, uh, the students who, who take courses and are not uh, quite uh, committed uh, to a, uh, a, an associate's degree or a credentialing type of pathway at GCC may uh, you know, incline to transfer over to the University of Guam. When they do, uh, uh, there is a sort of monitoring uh, between GCC and UOG of those transfer students who finish uh, a baccalaureate degree who may have satisfied in the process of completing their degree at the University of Guam uh, courses in order to fulfill a certain credentialing or a respective associate degree program so that that counts towards their uh, their resume uh, portfolio. And so uh, what's going to be uh, important on both sides, and, and certainly uh, under the reverse transfer agreement the University of Guam has committed to, is providing, uh, and we'll uh, soon be doing that, providing an on-site uh, counselor from the University of Guam to be able to uh, meet up with uh, students at the Guam Community College who intend to transfer over uh, towards a baccalaureate degree, uh, regardless of whether or not they're a degree seeker at GCC or they're, they're a swirler. So there's a, there's a strong commitment to make sure that there's student success being addressed from both ends. Let, 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 me, let me emphasize how generous a plan this is for GCC, <laughs> because this is really, when, if a student takes like uh, 45 credit hours at GCC, and doesn't have enough to complete an AA, and then they move to UOG, and then they take the courses that would have satisfied an AA, GCC gets them credit for that, and they give them an AA. And then GCC chalks it up to their college completion rate, <laughs> which is a really, uh, you know, <laughs> high indicator, I tell you. It's a motivator for, uh, you know, that's what accrediting agencies are looking at, and everything. So GCC gets the credit. So what may happen uh, is that a student at GCC, almost all their general ed requirements transfer over in the, in the articulation agreement. But if a student decide, at GCC decides to take culinary courses or a bunch of education courses or a bunch of practical nursing courses, which are not even in the UOG catalog, they're not going to transfer. See, that's what happened. And so that's an advisement issue. And so that's why uh, it's really critical that GCC, that, that they read the catalog, because it's in the catalog, and then also that we do uh, really close work on advisement. And, you know, the fact that GCC and, and UOG are almost co-located, you know, makes it easy for a student to do their own transfer program. <laughs> you know, I'll take a course here, because I hear this instructor is easier, I know that instructor over there, and the, because the courses are are interchangeable, then they're able to work that out. But if it was like a more normal situation, like, you know, in other places where the, the colleges are 10 miles apart or five miles apart, they wouldn't be doing that. So there's a lot of that uh, kind of activity, which is okay, you know. I mean, it's not a, that, I, I'm, I'm glad, we have a very healthy relationship with GCC on that score. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and I appreciate that, but yeah, it's something I think that, does cause a little bit of consternation, consternation among some of the young people. Again, they and maybe they don't understand. I think that the on-site uh, uh, counselor definitely would uh, be very beneficial to to those students to understand what courses. I mean, you did mention though, the, uh, Mr. President, that the you know maybe some of those who are taking allied health or or nursing courses over at GCC, those credits aren't transferable. And I guess the question then becomes, why not? Because because couldn't there be a, perhaps more of a coordination between the two programs because the ultimate objective is to be able to graduate more public health officials as well as nurses. Yeah, but one is a practical nurse and the other is a registered nurse and that's just a real classic uh, distinction between preparation. 
So okay. the kinds of things that you need in order to become a practical nurse, mm -hmm. you're going to have more practicums doing things that are not at the same level. And so when you have a third-year entry program, so that's, that's, that's the issue. It's the same thing with, uh, with uh, early childhood. Like if you're taking a bunch of education courses in order to run a daycare center, so do you take those courses and then become a certified teacher in DOE? Yeah, so th those are like qualitatively different things. They could be integrated, but I think they don't serve the community well because the testing for the, 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 uh, the, the practical nurse is different. They have it separate, and the, the, the NCLEX for the registered nurse is different. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, last point is that, you know, uh, I don't know if it was this term or, or perhaps last term, one of, the, one of our colleagues here was really trying to get in um, basic core programs into DOE, which basically would assist our young people to really better understand basic skills, just surviving skills in terms of being able to do checking accounts, doing, uh, you know, and, and things like that. Have you, is, is, I guess the first question is, is that part of something that is offered at University of Guam to help prepare our young people to, again, be able to survive in, in this business kind of environment as they go into adulthood? Sure. Uh, we, we recognize that we, we have a, a different type of generation coming into uh, higher education, and the first year experience is, is critical. So one of the, uh, the competencies that we want to expose our students to is financial literacy. Right. Recognizing that you know the, they'll be applying for FAFSA and there are opportunities to to pursue scholarships or other types of funding, but uh, to to ensure that they know just the basic responsibilities in terms of supporting a budget and being able to sustain themselves through their academic uh, journey in higher ed and and beyond. So is that a yes? Yes. <laughs> yes. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Today, Dr. Enriquez, you mentioned in one of your slides under student experience, the goal of the student success innovation team is to work to improve the pipeline of students coming into the university. Yes. And uh, Dr. Underwood, you spoke a little bit about um, the non-residency tuition or the residency tuition being applied to regional students. And I was just wondering if in your, in your quest to expand the student experience and also, you know, coming off of your more recent uh, Charter Day themes, there's no place like home, whether that same consideration can also be applied to students who are non-resident but of Chamorro ancestry. Uh, we know that there's a lot of interest in Guam. There's a lot of cultural uh, awakening coming up uh, that, that's been happening over the years. And many of the students that have not lived on Guam for a while, who, whose parents relocated as a result of military or otherwise, have a keen interest in returning back. And uh, I would think that uh, one of the incentives for coming home would be resident tuition for those types of, of uh, students. Is that something that you've considered? Or is it, being that, that you're, you're, the percentage uh, of the tuition, I mean, it's, it's going to be negligible, really, the, the impact. but it, in terms of the student experience and profile, it might have, well, have I, an impact. I, I don't know that we've uh, specifically entertained a proposal like that, but uh, you know, it doesn't really take very much effort on a returning student to set up residency here. So you know, they may have to pay a non-resident tuition for a, a year or so, or maybe even a semester, depending on how they uh, establish their residence. You know, they could come here and register to vote. That would be a good sign right there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, th that's a kind of a, an interesting policy issue. Never, never, I've, you know, I've run into the issue where uh, people have asked me, uh, Chamorros who live in the U.S., ask me, are they eligible for UOG scholarship programs? And I tell them, no, you're not, because you don't pay any taxes. <laughs> you know, that's what I tell them. And so, you know, the SFAP program is, is, is that kind of program. The tuition, I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I guess we can consider it, but I, I've never really thought of it that way. It's an interesting point. You know, we're, we're doing, uh, I know that in the Chamorro Studies program, uh, Dr. Bavakwa is uh, working on doing uh, uh, um, some distance ed courses 
to uh, to entice members of the Chamorro communities in the U.S. Uh, to take uh, courses in Chamorro studies, but uh, but uh, I've, 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 uh, we've never considered that policy proposal. Yeah, I, I think it's something that's worth exploring because if if you want the enriched campus experience, uh, you know clearly this demographic of of people uh, have had life experiences that could only enrich that. And then when you think about you know the just sure. the the idea of um, the idea of bringing more of our our people home and giving them incentives that might be might be just an incentive. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Afade, good morning, Mr. President. Afade. I, uh, fellow Triton. Oh, yes, fellow Triton. Oh, how many Tritons are there? We got a couple of Tritons here. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> tuition. <laughs> That's good. That's very good. <laughs> I, I, thank you, That's Mr. A President. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to uh, uh, congratulate everyone on the efforts and seeing the success of uh, the university uh, today. And I particularly like to uh, focus on the uh, the efforts being uh, looked at as far as the overall experience for the student. Uh, I have to admit that I was attracted to university because I wanted to wear a University of Guam Triton baseball uniform. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and we brought a lot of titles, but I have to say, a lot of those folks that were on the, the scholarship program that you know, the University of Guam uh, offered, and you know, to get us jump started, uh, attracted the the best athletes in Guam and. And I have to say, a lot of them, uh, uh, there was a great return on investment. A lot of them are officers today, teachers. Uh, one of them is a senator. And, right. and you, you have a lot uh, to show for with these athletic programs that we're expanding on. Uh, I bring that up because I see now where you're looking at soccer programs. You're looking at a lot of these um, uh, athletic uh, sports that have evolved in Guam and it's a different time, even with rugby and seeing that we can even compete within the region and seeing if there's a, an opportunity for us to also uh, get it to where we, we develop these athletes that are uh, within the university to participate in the region uh, continuously in, in competition. Are, are we looking to participate or try to keep incorporated? I know there's times where we invite for friendship tournaments, but I'm just trying to see if we could have that ability to compete uh, uh, throughout this region on a continuous basis, uh, in built uh, built into schedules, uh, and you know if we, I know we ha will have to have the ability to travel, but I'm just saying there's times where we can also uh, uh, we do invite students here to participate in university programs, but in athletics we could also do the same. Uh, well, Senator, you'd be happy to know that uh, we did field, uh, you know, in a lar large measure the success of that uh, uh, basketball team was uh, due to Mr. Wiegand and uh, Mr. Makapinlak, and, and they're very interested in basketball. Like you, I'm very interested in baseball, and <laughs> our, our new athletic director has indicated that we are going to field a team in two years yes, for you uh, UOG. Uh, so uh, we intend to participate in regular uh, leagues. They're not just just not on occasion, and it does add a dimension to um, um, uh, student life that has been missing. You know, I, I had a student once. I was uh, asking uh, him uh, why was why did he join ROTC. He said, "You know, ROTC is the only thing that has a, a, a life beyond classroom here at UOG. There's no fraternities. There's no athletic teams." I said, okay, let's have a th athletic teams. Let's not have fraternities. <laughs> let's have, we'll, we'll deal with that later, but let's have athletic teams at a, at a minimum. So that it, it is, and we've hired a new athletic director who has, uh, you know, who's now uh, running the field house. And so, you know, we have a new athletic director and we have uh, uh, a new dorm director. We have a new housing director. Uh, both of these individuals, again, uh, they're, they're hired off island, have infused new life into the planning for the international dorm. They've infused new life into the idea of how to deal with, uh, with athletic teams in a way that helps build the university. And it's all the greatest part about it that I'm happy to tell you, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, is that it's all self-sustaining. That's the greatest part of it. And, and, and uh, so we're, we're happy to do that. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, I appreciate that. It's you know the those things. Uh, I mean, I, I I I guess I look back in my days and like you said, I mean those um, experiences have really uh, uh, had a great impact. Uh, aside from the academics, uh, but you know I think those experiences to to leave a student leaving the university uh, are are will be greatly appreciated in, in, in the future. I want to talk one more thing about the computer science program and the Office of Technology uh, that is um, right now taking shape and trying to modernize their, uh, uh, their, their, their positions or staffing. And, and one of the challenges that, we, that they have there is uh, aligning, um, or I guess they, the, the type of positions that are in place right now are kind of uh, out, outdated. And I think that's going to take some time uh, to uh, with the new uh, chief technology officer. And I'm not sure if there's been any alliance being built or to see, uh, as we see with the nursing program and the uh, uh, other programs that are built into our, our, communi our communities or our government agencies that w definitely like to uh, uh, offer uh, opportunities within these uh, um, agencies. The IT industry, I believe, uh, at least within the government, um, seeing what is taking place with the Office of Technology, I, I feel could really attract the University of Guam st uh, uh, students to the computer science program. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that they're, with this new strategic initiative or plan that's being put in place, that that could be one of the items that could be uh, talked about aligning ourselves with the Office of Technology. I really believe this office uh, needs to grow, uh, not amongst in the University of Guam, but throughout our, our government, and and uh, the total reliance on uh, um, our private sector and being dependent on our private sector. Uh, uh, I know that's important, but uh, there has to have some independence on how we handle our IT uh, initiatives going forward. Well, thank you, Senator. I, w I was hoping I would get away and you wouldn't throw me a curveball, but uh, you, have thrown, you have a little bit of curveball with uh, computer science. Uh, one of the th th this is one of the other programs that we're actually uh, examining very closely. And uh, in fact, our, uh, we have a, a, you know, a, an ongoing task force to try to revise the program, revamp the program, make it more relevant, make it more connected uh, to actual uses and to applications not only in the, in the private sector but in the public sector as well. And so, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the two programs and both of them have come up in the course of the hearing. So, uh, you know, it, it just goes to show that uh, uh, A, we're transparent and B, you guys are paying attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. But, we, but you know, so, so just, just two, two things on that. We are very interested in that. I know that our CIO is very interested in that. And we're also uh, working uh, closely with the governor's office on, on, uh, on, on their own uh, information uh, technology activities. Uh, also, as part of EPSCOR, uh, the university is required to respond to a science and technology uh, plan for the whole island. And so, you know, we, uh, through EPSCOR, we've been able to create this council. And so we're in a, in a in, and although the council is mostly uh, comprised of people from uh, uh, other educational institutions and some from the governor's office and some from the private sector, it's actually an initiative that was uh, put forth by the university. Thank you. Just a couple of questions. I realize it's late, but I just need to ask two questions. When you're talking about the federalist, I mean um, financial assistance, did we ever address that? Uh, I see the uh, Regent Bloss behind you. Um, I mean Regent Santos. Um, the veterans, did we ever take care of the yellow ribbon? Everyone's pointing fingers. <laughs> no, you're, nobody was, but I, I just, when no, I realized I'm, I'm you had to. Mark? The Yellow Ribbon Scholarship. Remember, I spoke to you about the fact right, that right. some veterans I, I, I understand are really that. upset about the fact that they that, aren't that, able to that, have their children. That's right. That's right. I understand that. And to my knowledge, uh, no, we have not. But we will take care of it soon. But I know what you're talking about. And I don't know that it needed legislation. 
And I, I, I think I, I think did, I, I think, didn't think so either. I didn't. Th- I just... don't think so, given the kind of latitude that we have. We'll take care of that before the beginning of the fall semester. Because I mean, the veterans bring a lot of money into this sure, in, into sure this do. community, and as I understand it from them, their children. I mean, yeah. I know that for a fact because. My nieces are on yellow ribbons in the States, and uh, the amount of money that they're receiving is substantial. And to not take advantage of that, especially with the large number of veterans that we're producing here, um, would really do is something that should be addressed, like, immediately. Um, And then I'll ask the one question that's been skirted around the entire day. You talked about the fact that you're in dire straits. How large is the reserve currently? Um, we're we're behind about it's almost 14, 14 million. Um, yeah, we've we've been having regular meetings, but uh, it's it's been tough. Um, is that just for this fiscal for, year for, or yeah, no? We've gotten everything for FY fifteen. We we got that in December. We got the final payment in, in December. So, um, but uh, of the the billings that we've we've issued through July, uh, we're 13.8 behind. But you do have an agreement with them that at some point they will they will make good. We've gotten into yeah, we have an agreement that they're saying that we will get everything, and they they there's a timetable for us to okay. to get that. But yeah, they've they've been pledging that uh, we will. We will get all of our appropriation money for FY FY 16. And they were good in 15. They though were it good. Wasn't, in, they it were. wasn't until December, but as of today, your the, the they're withholding almost 14 million dollars, yes. which is half the, our appropriation. Yes, we, almost half. Yeah. And 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 it's the the most difficult situ- situation we've been in uh, in this time frame. And so what it does is that it it doesn't help us because what it does is it defers our hiring plans for another year. And that's that's that, and so it just it, it it throws everything up in the air. In addition to having problems with uh, a few vendors, although it's not as serious as uh, with some other agencies, but it is uh, getting to be that point. And the pass-throughs that you have under you are they suffering as a result of that? Uh, you mean like uh, KPRG? And uh, to my knowledge, no. Uh, Weary and uh, KPRG, no. Okay, please check. And the cancer. Yeah, and you brought up that. That's a fairly substantial pass through. Um, never mind. Okay. But you want, you want to close, I'll allow you to close. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, we enjoyed it much more than we thought we would. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> because, you know, this is always uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, you're, uh, we, we, are, we appreciate it. And uh, we, as always, uh, we recognize that the, the strength of the university is really based on the uh, uh, the backs and uh, the hard work of the people of Guam as evidenced through your support. And so we're very grateful for that, and we look forward to continuing to be of service to our beloved island. Thank you so much. Thank you again very much, Mr. President, and to the entire university community. Thank you. Thank you. The, we will stand in recess until 2 o'clock when we meet uh, to hear the budget for Guam Community College. Thank you.